Okay, as attendees continue to join, I'm going to give a quick introduction to this webinar before we get started. So this workshop is presented by the Minnesota Local Technical Assistance Program, LTAP, at the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. Minnesota LTAP is sponsored by the Minnesota Local Road Research Board and the Federal Highway Administration. LTAP is a program designed to provide local transportation agencies with the tools for improving operations. LTAP's ultimate goal is to foster a safe, efficient, environmentally sound transportation system by improving skills and knowledge of local transportation providers through training, events, demonstrations, technical assistance, and technology transfer. LTAP provides multiple training opportunities throughout the year at convenient locations around the state. There are also several online courses like today to choose from that can be attended anywhere you have access to a computer and Wi-Fi. Online courses are an easy way to get the training you need when you need it and when you have the time. LTAP also has a variety of newsletters, reference documents, videos, a website, and provides library services and technical document searches. CTAP is the mobile arm of Minnesota LTAP and provides on-site technical assistance training. Our instructor this morning is Kathy Schaefer. She has been a CTAP trainer since 2002 and has over 30 years of maintenance experience at MnDOT. And before I turn things over to Kathy, just a couple of quick things. If you have any questions today, technical questions, I'm here to help support you. So please pop those in the chat. Um, Kathy will be taking questions at the end of her presentation. So if you could put those in the Q&A box or in the chat, I'll be monitoring that and we'll make sure we cover those at the end of her uh, presentation. So Kathy, I'm gonna turn things over to you now, if you can share your screen. Okay. Let's see. Okay, thank you, Claire, and good morning to everyone. It sounds like we have a great attendance this morning, and as Claire said, I've been uh, teach, I've been the CTAP instructor for nearly 20 years now, and um, formerly I was a MnDOT maintenance worker. Um, I plowed out of our Mendota truck station, I ran our Metro Division landscape crew, and I also was the assistant supervisor at the Eden Prairie truck station. It was all a long time ago. <laughs> um, okay, so we'll get started here, but first I want to give a quick shout out to all of the Rhodes Scholar um, class of 22. And unfortunately, because, I'm sorry, class of 2020. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we didn't get to have a uh, formal recognition for them, but um, definitely wanna give them a shout out for their hard work and dedication in improving their knowledge and skills. So as far as our topics today, I'm gonna um, definitely wanna cover how de-icers work uh, the four R's, the right material, the right amount, and the right place at the right time. I want to talk about um, minimizing environmental impacts and some sustainability measures that we can put into play, and also technology and innovation. <clears throat> okay, this is a quote from Clear Roads, and Clear Roads is a consortium of, I think it's 32 cold weather states in the US and um, snow removal is a huge issue for all of our cold weather states. And their quote is snow and ice removal operations is one of the most critical functions of state and local transportation uh, agencies in cold weather regions. Um, it's also a huge part of the budget. I think you all probably know that. So, De-icing chemicals um, is also a big part of uh, keeping those roads clear and safe. And salt is by far 
the most common de-icer that's used, not just in Minnesota, but actually all over the world as far as a de-icer. It's most, the most common and also the most cost-effective de-icer. So let's talk a little bit about salt and de-icers. Well, de-icers work by lowering the freezing point of water. So instead of water freezing at 32 degrees, um, you put some salt in there and it's going to freeze at a lower temperature. So um, usually at this point, I like to show this video on how de-icing chemicals work um, that was produced by the Iowa um, Department of Transportation. But because of um, this being a webinar, the videos don't show very well. So I do want to make these available to you. There's 14 videos and they're really, really well done. They just updated them a few years ago. Because I can't show the video, I did take some screenshots and I just want to kind of walk through how the de-icing chemicals work. So I think you all know that water is made up of H2O. So we have two hydrogen ions and one oxygen ion. And the positive hydrogen ions are attracted to those negatively charged oxygen ions. And water molecules can exist in three different states, being either a gas, a liquid, or a solid. So water molecules in their gaseous state uh, move so fast that they bounce off of each other and they never become attached. In the liquid state, the water molecules move slowly enough to attach to each other, but too fast to form ice crystals. And in their frozen state, Molecules lock together. They're still moving a little bit, but they lock together in these six sided crystals, ice. So, what happens when salt is applied to an icy pavement? So, salt or sodium chloride molecule is made up of a positively charged sodium ion and a negatively charged chloride ion. <clears throat> so when salt is applied to ice, and the key is if there's water present, those salt molecules begin to dissolve. They break apart into positive sodiums and negative, negatively charged chloride ions. Now, the negative oxygen ions in water are strongly attached to the, um, are strongly attracted to the positive sodium ions in the salt. And the positive hydrogens in the water are attracted to the negative chloride ions in the salt. And because water molecules are more strongly attracted to sodium and chloride, the ice crystals actually separate, they break apart. And that's how we get the melting. <clears throat> so a couple of key takeaways is that first, salt only works when it's dissolved. So water has to be present. And as the temperature drops and or the salt brine is diluted, that reaction of breaking apart ice crystals is going to happen more and more slowly. So this slide um, is actually taken from our snow and ice control handbook. And it il illustrates how much salt or how much ice can be melted by salt. So at a pavement temperature of 30 degrees, one pound of salt, which is about the equivalent of a big coffee mug full of salt. Um, at one pound of salt, we'll melt 46.3 pounds of ice in five minutes. So it happens really fast and a lot of ice can be melted. Drop down to 25 degrees, just five degree temperature drop. You're only gonna melt 14 pounds of ice with that one pound of salt. 
and it's going to take twice as long. It's going to take 10 minutes. At 20 degrees, you're going to melt 6.8, I'm sorry, 8.6 pounds of salt in 20 minutes. And at 15 degrees, and this is the temperature that most agencies determine is the cutoff for applying salt. At a pavement temperature of 15 degrees, one pound of salt will only melt 6.3 pounds of ice and it will take an hour. So from 30 to 15 degrees, you're losing that melting ability of 40 pounds and it takes so much longer. So that's generally the cutoff. So also we need to understand the phase diagram. And the phase diagram shows where various concentrations of salt brine will change from liquid to solid. So anytime you're within this blue area and you have a high enough concentration of salt, melting is going to occur. So if you have too little salt, then you're going to get refreeze. So if you fall into this area, actually too much salt, um, you get crystallization and um, no more salt or no more ice is going to be melted unless there's more liquid added. And then in this bottom area, below that eutectic temperature of minus six, no melting is going to happen. Salt will not melt lower than minus six. So the eutectic temperature is the maximum freeze point depression. So if you have a pavement temperature of 20 degrees and you have a salt brine of 23.3%, melting is going to happen. Now, the solution concentration um, can be diluted by a couple, two factors either by additional precipitation falling or that melted ice or snow also causes dilution. So we're always working um, to try to maintain that um, balance of dilution of solution. So if you have a 20% um, pavement temperature, but the concentration falls to 10%, you, you have too little salt and you're going to get refreeze again. Conversely, if, you, if the pavement temperature drops to three degrees, but you still have a high concentration of salt, say 20%, you're going to fall within this light blue area again and refreeze will occur. So again, dilution of solution, is kind of a continuous battle that we're fighting. So that's why we're always looking for the appropriate material application to ensure that the concentration doesn't dilute to the point where material, the salt becomes ineffective. So it's important to know your chemicals, whether it's sodium chloride, which that's the most common deicer, but you might be mixing it with some uh, magnesium chloride or calcium chloride, and they melt at colder temperatures. And in this case, you're using a conveyor to um, add calcium chloride along with a dye um, to uh, create this treated salt. So depending on the chemical you, you use, you need to know um, the most, the practical melting temperature. So again, Sodium chloride, the, the lowest practical melting temp is about 15 degrees. Some agencies say 20, but 15 is pretty common. Magnesium chloride, um, that's usually a kind of a range, but the very lowest practical melting temperature is usually a, a considered about 10 degrees below zero. And calcium is a minus 20. Now these eutectic temperatures that you see in this column, those are important for storage purposes. We would never store tanks of chloride, sodium chloride brine 
outside in the wintertime because it's going to freeze up because we do drop below minus six frequently. Um, but we could store calcium chloride brine outside because um, if you have the optimal concentration of about 30%, um, you're not going to get refreeze or get it to freeze up until minus 60. So that eutectic is important for storage purposes. It's important to know that lowest practical melting temperature for your materials. So the four R's come into play all the time that we're out there plowing and applying chemicals. So we want to make sure that we are using the right material in the right amount, the right place, and at the right time. So there are a number of strategies that um, agencies employ. And it, it depends on what your goal is. What do you want to achieve? Do you want to achieve bare pavement? Um, most agencies don't have that. Um, goal. However, sometimes in a downtown area, that might be the goal. Um, we might have a, a goal of bare wheel paths or just plowed and treated. And a lot of agencies have plowed to snowpack. And you can see in this case, it looks like they've applied sand rather than salt. So agencies to achieve their goal should have um, put in place certain performance measures. So do you have clear standards? And when you set your standards, it's always a good idea to have public involvement, get the public's input on what they think is an acceptable uh, level of service. You should also have a snow removal plan. And in that plan, some of the things that you're going to address are uh, maybe time to bear lane or time to regain speed or the time to regain traction. So it might be acceptable to regain tra traction within, say, six hours after the storm event has ended. You know, that, that kind of a, um, approach. Now, <clears throat> the MPCA does have some sample snow and ice management policies on their website. So you can um, go there, take a look at them, use them as a template and develop your own snow and ice management policy. Um, and these um, policies are also important for MS4 communities. And if you are an MS4 community, you know who you are. And so MS4 permittees, um, should be implementing salt storage BMPs. So we want to make sure that salt isn't running off and out from our um, storage sheds. Um, we're also implementing BMPs to um, make sure that when we load the trucks with, with material, that if it spills out, it's cleaned up right away. Um, and within this, there should be a written snow and ice management policy. Um, also individuals, anybody who's performing winter maintenance activities should be trained in uh, water protection and how uh, chemicals affect our water. Um, workers should also be trained in minimizing the use of de-icers and other tools and resources. So some of the performance me measures, um, really, I think one of the most key ones is uh, the level of service. Now, certain roads are going to have different levels of service. So it's important that workers know what that level is for the various roads they might plow and be treating with uh, chemicals. So the main street through town um, or the main highway those might have a higher level of service than a residential street. So we don't want to see residential streets with that is salt residue on that street. There was a lot of salt applied 
on this residential street. This was um, photo was taken quite a few years ago. But um, it's important that workers understand that the level of service um, is different for different roads very often. So the thing that we need to ask is, okay, are the um, practices that we're currently using, are they also sustainable? Okay, we wanna make sure that we keep those roads clear, but are, are we using practices that are going to be sustainable um, to our environment for a long time into the future? So the federal EPA has set standards for pollutants in our waters. And the pollutant um, levels for uh, chloride in Minnesota, um, well, we'll talk about what those, stand, what those levels are, but currently there are 50 water bodies in Minnesota that exceed the standard for chloride. There are another 75 that are very close to meeting that standard or that threshold. So this map shows um, where you can see where the colored bodies of water are. Um, there's a few in outstate. Most of them are occurring in the Twin Cities metro area. And that makes sense. I mean, if you think about it, it's because we have you know, the highest uh, population concentration in the metro area. Um, but don't let this map fool you because just because a body of water is not um, shown in color other than blue doesn't mean it isn't um, impacted by chloride. It just means it hasn't been tested yet. There's no chloride data available. So, and you can look at this map and see how much water we have in Minnesota. It's a great undertaking to try to get out and test all of these bodies of water for chloride. The other thing that I do want to say is this has been monitored um, at least, I think, for at least 20 years now. We've been monitoring chlorides in water. And we add bodies of water to this um, chloride list but none have been removed so far. We have not removed any, even though we have been taking measures to try to uh, mitigate this um, environmental impact. So the um, standard for chloride, there's a chronic and an acute standard. The chronic standard is 230 milligrams per liter, which is roughly one teaspoon of salt in five gallons of water. And to be honest, I don't think you'd even taste a teaspoon of salt in the water. But that chronic standard um, affects the organisms that live in the water. So things like um, dragonflies and mayflies, caddisflies, they spend most of their life as little larvae living in the water. And what happens if there's a salt content in the water, those organisms don't thrive. They may die young, they have limited reproduction, um, and these little organisms are food for fish. So this is important that we um, keep these little critters alive. There's also an acute standard. And that is 860 milligrams per liter, which is roughly a tablespoon of salt in five gallons of water. And at the acute standard, um, then we would see actual um, die off of uh, fish, perhaps, and other, um, other organisms. Now, in some cases, we do hit that acute standard in the springtime where that first rain happens and this, the salt residue on the streets and sidewalks and everywhere else 
flushes off of those pavement surfaces and into streams. And the, the stream shows a, a real high spike um, after that or during and af right after that first rain. Luckily with rivers, the, they have the ability to clean and, and flush themselves. Whereas lakes and groundwater don't have that ability. So the thing about chlorides, now remember back when we were looking at those slides about how the chloride attaches to the water molecules. Um, that is a real strong attraction and it doesn't separate out very easily. Chloride does not break down. It simply continues to accumulate in surface and groundwater. Notice it does flush out of um, streams, but in lakes and groundwater, it continues to accumulate. Now, um, I just use this photo of Prior Lake just because I think it's a really cool photo. This is not to um, imply that Prior Lake is listed high for chlorides. Um, I just thought this was a cool photo. But our lakes are suffering, especially in the Twin Cities metro area, from high chlorides. So chloride can be removed from water. We can use reverse osmosis, which is what this plant here is um, in Orange County, California. Um, there's other methods. There's electrodialysis, distillation, and evaporation. But there is no practical way to remove chlorides from our surface water and groundwater here in Minnesota. We just have too much of it. Now, the reason Orange County is using this system is they are pumping ocean water through these um, uh, reverse osmosis filters, and then they pump it to a filtration system and they purify it. And then it's used for public or human consumption. Um, but that's simply because there's such drought issues in California. But really there's no practical way for us to remove the chlorides from our ground and surface waters. <clears throat> so when we go out there and we're working to remove the snow and ice from the roadway, Mechanical removal is truly the most environmentally friendly method to remove that snow and ice. The chemicals we use are there to complement the plowing. And I've been stressing this for many years and I will continue to do so, that burning off the snow, if we, oh, we only got about two inches, just go burn it off don't put down your plow, is not a good strategy. Now remember that that salt is going to dilute out right away and we're going to have a potential for refreeze. So put off first and then use your chemical. Um, the purpose of the chemicals also are to lessen the bond between the ice and the pavement and that makes plowing more e easy. It helps us to scrape off that residual that's um, underneath there, underneath the plow. So we're really trying to strike a balance. So we're, we have to take into account safety and mobility. So that's the social portion of it. We have that economic portion. We have to work within a budget. And the chemicals we use are expensive. And also we have to balance the environmental impacts of our chemical applications. So what we're trying to achieve is this little area right here, that is the optimal area where we have um, a good balance between safety and mobility budgets and environmental protection. So it kind of sounds like this is a losing battle. There's nothing we can do, but there are measures that we can take. So first of all, 
Keep an open mind to new ideas, techniques, equipment, and materials. Um, always be looking for different ways to approach um, our snow and ice winter maintenance operations. Taking that attitude of, well, we've always done it this way, is not a good or sustainable um, way to look at things. And I like Albert Einstein's quote here, a problem cannot be solved with the same consciousness that created it. So look for new and different ways. Some of the things that we can do. All right. Um, in our Minnesota Snow and Ice Control Handbook, we have a number of applications. So the application rate charts that we have in the handbook are examples of different agencies, um, what they use. And I like this one from Anoka County. They told us we could use this. And they, their quote here is, use as much material as necessary, but as little as possible. So again, trying to strike that balance. So your application rate charts that you develop will be based on the materials that you use and that you can afford. So um, you know, it depends on your budget. Um, also, the uh, your application rate tables should be based on the prescribed level of service. And you might have a couple of different tables, one for your main routes and one for residential routes. So which will have probably have different levels of service. Your rate tables might also um, take into account route travel time. Some agencies, um, the trucks have one pass to get that road clear. So eight hour shift, it takes eight hours to um, get through their entire route. Other agencies, uh, the truck, um, this happens more often in cities, of course. Trucks might be able to hit um, the different roads. Um, also shift time. What time does your shift begin and end? Are you, um, do you allow overtime? So if the storm continues throughout the afternoon and into the evening, um, will workers be allowed to continue um, or, or are they pulled off after eight hours and come back tomorrow? Um, your application rate tables will also depend on whether you're using anti-icing, so you're out there putting chemical down before a storm, or if you have a wedding. So um, a lot of different factors come into play with your tables that you develop. Um, and these tables should not be static. They should be sort of a living document and adjusted as needed. So um, you've developed these tables from your experience from last year. Well, now maybe you have a budget that allows you to use some different new materials. So you might be changing your application rate tables depending on the fact or because of the fact that now you have um, some calcium chloride in your arsenal as well. So these should be adjusted as needed. Um, there are also a number of other areas where you can go to find um, application rate table examples. So Clear Roads has a whole um, uh, research study on different application rates. Um, there's a number of other sources to find these um, examples. So you could go just Google it and um, you'll find a number of different examples from different um, agencies across the country. Other things that we can do to help um, minimize some of our impacts and make sure we're um, really um, effective in our snow removal is to get out there and prepare ahead of time. So this is the time of year we're doing that, that preparation. So get out, have workers drive the roads, look for low overhead, especially 
an issue? Well, it can be for counties as well as cities. Um, are there low hanging branches that your truck might hit? Are there low hanging wires? Um, so look for those low overhead thing issues. Um, look for mailboxes. Somebody might have decided, well, my mailbox got pushed over by snow last year. So I'm going to um, concrete it in and put use bricks and concrete. And now that mailbox will, won't ever be tipped over again. Well, your wing might hit that concrete and rip the wing off. So get out and look for those kind of things too. Are there raised manhole or gate valve covers? I saw um, a truck hit a raised manhole and totally ripped the wing off. And there was hydraulic fluid, there was a gasoline spilled. It was a real mess. And it was a very expensive repair on that truck. So look for any kind of issues like that. And you might have raised concrete islands. You know, there might be a, a raised median um, on your, some of your roads. So look for those kind of things as well, because we do want to avoid hitting them. Uh, the repairs can be incredibly expensive if we hit some of these obstacles. That happened out in Western Minnesota. This was quite a few years ago, but you can see it's sort of a mini environmental disaster with all of that hydraulic fluid and um, what a, all the chemical that spilled. There was a sand salt mix there. So we want to avoid this kind of thing. Also in your preparation, you can go to the um, Clear Roads um, project 14-03. Uh, and this has little animated videos on how to plow complex intersections and interchanges. So have, has your community added uh, roundabouts or J turns or cross, um, these, those crossover intersections? Um, there's a lot of different um, complex intersections that are um, being built. And they came up with some really good little um, animated videos on which truck should go first and which where they should go and that sort of thing. So could be very helpful for you. Um, this could also help because sometimes one truck might go through, plow and apply, and then another truck comes shortly thereafter and plows off the first truck's chemical and they're applying too. So um, it can help to avoid that plowing off of a recently applied chemical. Also in our preparations, we should um, look for areas that are prone to drifting. So open areas, um, you might have farm fields in a rural area. In an urban area, you might have sports complexes. Um, lakes tend to be wide open and they can cause drifting. Um, and also newly cleared developments have, you know, has the ground, the land been totally cleared and they're gonna uh, put in a new housing development. Um, that could be an area that's prone to drifting. And in those areas, make sure that workers, especially new workers, Understand that applying material can really cause problems. And a little story about my early experience. I was um, ply, plowing a highway and there was a sports complex and um, that alongside the, the road. And it was a, a high school. There was football fields, baseball fields, et cetera. And, um, but it's at a high school. So I'm thinking, well, it's a lot of kids driving, so I should apply a lot of chemicals. So I went through there and hit, hit it hard with the salt. And I made a huge mess because the snow, at, before I went in there, the snow was blowing across the road. I put chemical down and the snow stuck to that chemical. And we had to get trucks with underbodies come off of a different route to scrape that ice off that I had created. So um, understand that chemicals can cause problems in these areas that are prone to drifting. 
If you do have areas that are prone to drifting, I recommend going to this um, blowing snow control tools that was developed uh, with MnDOT and the University of Minnesota. And this is, they have some really good information here. So first of all, they have a cost benefit tool and it's an Excel spreadsheet and you put in your information like how many times do you have to go out and babysit this area because it's prone to drifting. You have to go back and hit that, you know, much more frequently than the rest of your roads. And um, are there are there crashes and um, et cetera, et cetera. So you put in all the information that it asks for and it helps determine the benefit of installing um, snow fencing. And then you can go to the design tool. And the design tool, this is really cool. You put in all of your information, like the direction of the road, the uh, whether it runs north, south, east, west, whatever, um, the uh, direction of the prevailing winds in the wintertime. Um, and then it will give you information on whether you, you, if you want to use a living snow fence or a structural snow fence and what the porosity of that snow fence should be, meaning how much air can move through it, how porous is it. It'll also tell you how far back from the road the fence should be, how tall it should be, and what angle it should run um, in relation to the roadway. So it'll give you all kinds of information and to help um, reduce that um, issue of drifting snow. Another thing that it has on that website, which I find just really interesting, is um, it gives you the blowing snow coefficient or the relocation coefficient. And I just use Beltrami County here as an example. And you can see the different colors. In the southeast corner, it falls into the 0.2 range. Throughout a good portion of uh, the county, it is in the um, 0.3 range. And then in a couple of sections in the northwest and the far northeast also, um, it falls into the 0.4. And what that means is from 0.2 to 0.4 means 20 to 40% of the snow that falls out of the sky blows somewhere else. So they have drifting issues, most likely in the Northwest portion of Beltrami County. Now these areas that you see that have the darkest blue, that's exceeding that 0.7, those areas have blowing conditions that are similar to Siberia, which I think is just <laughs> really interesting. Um, it'll also give you the average snowfall for the county. In Beltrami County averages 2.7 feet of snow. So that's, that's quite a bit of snow. So just a very interesting website to go take a look at. Okay, other things we should do in preparation for winter is take a look at our salt sheds. Um, do we have any design flaws? Is there an issue with water running into the shed or salted water running out of the shed? Are you overfilling your shed? Um, and in this case, I would say this shed is definitely filled too full. Now they did tarp the toe. They have some tires and tarps there trying to hold, hold it all in, but you can see there's still runoff. And we've had issues in Minnesota where agencies have had fines from the MPCA and or have had to pay claims to adjacent landowners where, um, Crops were damaged because of high salt content into this that's gotten into their soils. 
So um, to avoid this, take a look at your sheds. And this, this type of shed, this area from the post back to where the wall starts, that is supposed to be the loading area. So don't overfill your sheds. Another thing that should be done at this time of year is to calibrate your trucks. And this is a quote from Wilfred Nixon. And he says that if you don't measure it, you really can't manage it. So, um, and, and it's so true. And think about it. Our standard controls, they are actually a measuring instrument. They measure how much material is delivered um, through that sander box. So when should you calibrate? You should calibrate every year. Now, um, a lot of agencies will do, rather than a full calibration, they'll do a verification test. And if it falls within a certain percentage, it's pretty close, um, then it, it's good to go. But if it doesn't fall within that 10% um, um, range, then it um, needs to be recalibrated. After any hydraulic repairs, you're gonna have different pressure if you've had ma major hydraulic repairs. Um, so it's important to recalibrate then as well. After replacing an auger, you, know, you, had, you had an older auger um, that was worn down and now you have a bigger auger in there. Um, you're gonna have different uh, flow rates um, per revolution of that auger. So then you should recalibrate. And all new trucks should be calibrated. Doesn't matter. <laughs> they might say they're calibrated. They probably are not. So go through the calibration steps and always calibrate your new trucks. Now there's different equipment you can use. <clears throat> Mostly, most agencies are using some pretty low tech equipment. Um, you just need something to collect the material. So in this case, there's a bottomless box here. And we know that that holds four five gallon pails of salt. So that's an easy way to um, measure an amount of salt there. <clears throat> you, you will need a five gallon pail. Uh, a tarp might be necessary. You'll need a scale. And Washington County um, built this little tripod and they just hang that fish scale there and then they can lift that pail of salt up, hook it on there and um, determine the weight. Um, you'll need some shovels. Usually it'll take at least two or three people. And you're gonna need some bungee cords. The bungee cords are used to hold that spinner out of the way so that the salt just falls into whatever you're using to collect it. Sometimes we just take the, the spinner off altogether. Um, there are some high-tech uh, equipment options also, and these digital scales are really slick. Um, and the nice thing is um, it, doesn't require a lot of lifting from you know employees, so you know saves on the back. Um, you can take larger samples, and the larger the sample, the more accurate your calibration is going to be. You can actually do two or three samples in one load to load up this whole box, and you can see there's this is the um, digital readout of what the weight is. Um, there's a metal uh, style and a plastic one. This is the plastic style. Um, and again, there's no lifting to weigh that sample. It's just all done digitally. So where do you get information on how to calibrate? Well, we have information on our MnDOT maintenance training website. So this is, um, this is open to the public. Anybody can go here. Um, so we have a PDF. This is just a little booklet on how to calibrate the Force America 5100 type sander controller. Um, that booklet also has information on how to calibrate uh, the old style manual type controllers. Um, we have information on how to calibrate the Dickie John 
uh, type controller and also a Greason. And then the Force America 6100, um, we have information. This is a video on how to calibrate. And it's about a half hour video. And it takes you through step by step on how to calibrate uh, that type of controller. Now, if you have any one of these or a different brand, um, you can always contact uh, the uh, company you bought it from. Um, if it's a Dickie John, get a hold of them if you want them to come out and help you um, with the calibration. Uh, Force America people, they're, they're great about coming out to help calibrate as well. So, um, but you should be calibrating. And if you need help, get a hold of the company where you bought it. Now, I don't know if this is gonna play, but I, I'll give it a shot. This system is very difficult to calibrate. Oh, let me go back. I don't know if it will. So I don't know if you if that played very well, but um, there are two guys in the back of that truck and they're shoveling salt out of the back of the truck onto the roadway. And I've, I, I don't know who sent this to me. It was a few years ago. So I've been using this little video clip for, for quite a while. And um, it's funny because older guys will come up to me and say, hey, Kath, that is not so far-fetched. Back in the uh, early 70s, we actually did, um, get into the back of the truck and shovel salt out. And then there was a, another fellow who told us they bought a old school bus and they would fill it with salt and they cut a hole in the bottom of the floor and they would shove salt out the bottom of the floor to salt their roads. So <laughs> some old fashioned innovative ways of uh, applying salt but very difficult to calibrate. Okay, on that maintenance training website, there's also information in the anti-icing guide on how to calibrate for liquid applications. So this is the time of year you should be calibrating your liquid um, tanks as well. So, and we, we always calibrate the liquids with water in the fall. So this is the time to do it. So if you have a um, rate of 10 gallons per minute, and this is on a gravity feed, and you're traveling at 30 miles an hour, you're going to be applying 20 gallons per lane mile. So that's just a simple um, little equation, but it helps to understand exactly how much you're applying. Another thing you might um, consider looking at is the augers that you're using. So a lot of agencies over time will go from um, using sand, mostly sand, to switching to salt. Now the um, augers and auger motors originally were designed strictly for sand and now that we're switching over to using a lot more salt, it's a good idea to um, use salt augers. Now, there's some different styles. Um, so this is a, a, the top photo here. This is the old sand auger and you, it's a nine inch diameter. So it takes up a good portion of that sander box, which is important. Um, because then you don't get that uh, clumping where it freezes up. If, if it's a small six inch auger in that wide sander box, we tend to get some clumping. Um, so for the sand, you see that this has a six inch pitch with four inch flighting. So the flights are four inches high and each revolution delivers 342 cubic inches of material. It's a lot of material coming out, but if it's sand, you, you kind of need that much. 
If you're applying salt, you just don't need that much chemical. So there's a couple of companies now that make these um, nine inch special augers. Now they are more expensive, I know that, but um, you know we're, we're balancing that environmental concern as well. So these still have a nine inch um, diameter. So it takes up a good portion of that uh, sander box, but notice that it has a six inch uh, center shaft. So, um, that takes up a lot of room. It's only a four inch pitch from one flight to the next. It's only four inches um, instead of the six. And the flighting, depending on the brand you buy, it's e they're either an inch and a half or two inches high. So they're delivering a lot less material per revolution. You can see um, these special augers deliver 124 cubic inches per revolution. So it's about a third of what the uh, um, old fashioned augers deliver. So this is something to consider. Another thing that you, um, you really need to know is what is gonna happen with the weather. And a couple of things about weather forecasting. First of all, if you're getting your information simply from the television news station, um, you know, we're checking out Channel 4 or whatever, uh, they don't have a big crew of people um, working with a number of different models to determine what is probably going to happen. Um, so they're not terribly accurate. They're not really site specific which is really what we need for um, our winter maintenance operations. We need to know, are the temps gonna rise or fall after that snow? Generally, throughout a good portion of the winter, when we get snow, the temps fall afterwards, except for later in the season, towards the end of winter, then a lot of times we'll get rising temperatures after the snow event. So that's an important piece of information for you. Also, you need to know the pavement temperatures. The temperature of the air and the pavement temperature can differ greatly. So um, having accurate pavement temperature is really important. Also, what kind of precipitation are you gonna get? Is it gonna start off as a uh, rain and turn over to snow? Um, you know, what, what kind of, um, event is it going to be? And what is the rate of snowfall and the intensity? Also, the timing of the event is really important. Um, you know, the television newscaster might, or weather forecaster might say, well, um, we're expecting the snow to start at um, seven o'clock and go through um, noon. And by noon, it'll be out of here. Well, it didn't happen that way. It, it didn't start until 11 o'clock and it didn't end until 6 p.m., you know, and that happens a lot. So um, having good timing of that event is really crucial. How long is it gonna last too? Sometimes they'll say, oh, it'll blow through in two hours and it doesn't. So having that information, you know, how long is it gonna last? And also wind speed and direction. So where can you get some of this information that's more accurate? Well, there's a number of private forecasting services that you can, um, it's, a, you know, you pay to have this information. Um, they use smaller scale models. Um, they have pavement temperatures, a lot of them. Um, they might trigger warnings if they know that there won't be good grip. Um, and they have a large pool of talent. So it's not just one person reading um, a model or one or two models. Um, so there's a lot large pool and they're reading a number of different models and they're uh, discussing it among themselves and what they think is going to be, um, what's gonna happen with that event. Another option is the National Weather Service. Um, that NWS chat, um, they 
actually are have people on hand that you can call up and get some real time information from them. And they like getting phone calls. So feel free to use that. They're very, very helpful. Having pavement temperature um, is really, really important because like I said, the temperatures can vary between the air and the pavement considerably. So you might use an infrared type sensor that's mounted on the mirror of the truck and you get a readout in the cab. Um, and that will give you air and road temp. Um, the newer style computerized uh, sander controllers have air and road temp um, sensors. You might have a stationary type sensor that's mounted on a pole. And these are, these are very useful. And the nice thing about some of these, this, this type is they will actually send out uh, an alert to supervisors saying, um, you know, we're, we're losing grip. Um, you know, it, it'll just come in as a text message that, you know, grip is being lost or that there's a freezing rain falling or whatever. And then the supervisors can call out crews as needed. So those can be very, very useful. And the other thing that's nice about these, they're not invasive. Um, they're, they're just an infrared um, beam that's shot down onto a pavement surface. So what are some other strategies that we can, that we can take to um, you know, maximize our snow and ice removal efforts? Well, taking a proactive approach is always a good idea. So getting out there and applying some material to the roadway surface before an event is um, really very helpful. Now, if it's a, a snow event and you're still gonna get accumulation, but the bond between the snow or ice and the pavement will be weaker. Whereas no snow, um, no chemical was applied on this right-hand side and all those little nooks and crannies fill up with ice and it forms a very tight bond, makes it very hard to plow off. So um, that proactive approach of anti-icing um, can help to buy you time. So maybe that event started at 4 a.m. and your crew isn't scheduled to come in till seven, um, but you put some material down yesterday afternoon and so when crews get out there, they can plow it off more easily. Um, often, fewer passes are required to get back to uh, a safe driving condition and less material is needed overall um, to melt through a snowpack. So anti-icing can be very effective, cost-effective and environmentally safe. And on that maintenance training website, we do have our anti-icing guide and it has a lot of good information. Um, so I encourage you to go take a look at this. It's a small booklet. You can just print it out and staple it together. And I also wanna mention uh, this um, anti-icing go or no go decision, decision chart for anti-icing. And I attended a Brian webinar uh, just uh, two weeks ago, I think it was. And um, they mentioned this go, no go chart. And so I got a hold of them and they, they gave me the location where you can find it. And it's just a little brochure like this that you can print out. And that's pretty small. So I cut it in half and I printed it here. And so, oh dear, how do I get rid of that? Hold on. So up at the top, it's kind of blocked by um, the uh, Zoom things, but it says, um, is there an event scheduled 
within the next three days? Are they predicting that there will be a snow or frost event within the next three days? And if so, then um, yeah, you can go out and anti-ice. If it's longer or further out than three days, it's probably not going to be very effective. Most of your material will have just worn away by the time the event hits, if it's more than three days. Okay, next, does the forecast indicate that the event might start with rain? And if so, don't anti-ice because it's just going to wash away. So that would just be a waste of material. Um, then you have to look at temperatures. Okay, will the pavement temperature, when you apply the material and at the start of, of the storm, be 15 degrees or warmer. So remember that salt loses its efficiency below 15 degrees. So if it's going to be colder, use a low temp material, such as magnesium chloride or calcium chloride. Okay, then we have to look at the relative humidity because we can create very slippery roads if it's humid. So is the humidity low enough and the pavement dry enough that it will not dilute out and um, when the salt brine is dispensed? So you want a dew point of three degrees below the pavement temp or relative humidity below 70%. If it's high, higher humidity, in fact, um, for magnesium chloride and calcium chloride, we generally say uh, humidity uh, below 50%. Okay, then we need to think about the winds again. Will the winds get uh, to 15 miles an hour or higher before or during the storm? Um, and if so, um, putting down that chemical might cause blowing snow that's blowing across the roadway to stick and you're just creating ice. So if it's gonna be a windy um, snowfall, don't apply anti-icing. Okay, and have you checked the pavement both visually or with your sensors for residue? And um, some of those sensors can um, indicate whether there's um, salt residue on that pavement. And if there's enough residue left from prior events, you may not need to anti-ice. So don't, don't add any more. So these are all the steps that you should go through so to determine whether we should go out and anti-ice or whether we should not. So down here on the red bullet at the bottom, if you've worked your way through the considerations on this chart, then you most likely have the right conditions for anti-icing with salt brine at 30 to 50 gallons per lane mile, according to your agency's policy. However, you should always be guided by your own experience too. So um, take advantage of this. I think it's a good little flow chart. Another important thing, this, not, this does not come into play very often for cities because most city streets are posted pretty low speed, but this might come into play for um, anybody who's working on a county highway or MnDOT highway. And speed management is really important. So um, you sh just should not be applying material at a high rate of speed, um, 30 miles an hour maybe maximum um, to keep that material on the road. If you're going faster than that, it's just going to blow off as you can see in this photo. So other um, methods that we use, and I think um, more and more agencies are using pre-wetting. And pre-wetting is really one of the best things we can do. First of all, it reduces the bounce and scatter. So you don't have something like this. That to me looks like just dry salt with no liquid at all. So pre-wetting reduces the bounce and scatter. And often these um, pre-wetting materials have a sticky component to them and it actually helps stick that salt to the roadway. So um, that can be very useful as well. Um, let's see. 
pre-wetting increases the melting speed. Remember back earlier in the program, we talked, I talked about how um, that salt needs to be wet in order for it to actually break apart ice crystals. And so you're getting the salt granules wet, so they are starting to dissolve or they're going into solution. And that is going to speed up the rate of melting. Now, Michigan Highway Department did a study on um, comparing dry material application to pre-wet applications. And they did this um, quite a few years ago. I don't know, probably 15 to 20 years ago. They actually repeated the, their study just a few years ago. And they came up with pretty much the same results. So this black part here, that indicates a 24 foot pavement. And so we want to keep the chemical concentrated to the one center or the one third uh, center of the roadway. And if we're applying pre-wet material, 78% of that material stays in that center one third of the roadway. Where if it's dry, only 46% stays in the center of the roadway. Um, some of that material is going to move out to the um, outer wheel paths. And you can see the uh, pre-wet, we have 9% that's moved out to the outer wheel paths. And the dry material, we have 12% that's moved out. But the really um, important piece to take home here is how much actually blew off the roadway. And only about 4% was unretrieved or blew off onto the shoulder of the roadway. Whereas 30% of the dry salt is poof, it's just gone. So that's important to think about. Um, you know, if you're applying dry material and you're not going real slow, that material is going to go blow off one third of your truckload could be going into the ditch or off onto the shoulder. So that's a lot of wasted salt. So there's a lot of different methods for onboard pre-wetting. There's these older tanks that are still being used today. Generally, they are gravity feed. Um, there's these newer type trucks that have, um, they have a pump system and they can be very accurate and you can apply a lot of liquid with, with this type of system. But either way, whichever one you're using, they're both effective. So the older style um, with the gravity feed uh, depends on how full that tank is. <laughs> when it's really full, you might be getting 14 gallons a ton. Um, when it's nearly empty, it's gonna be less, um, getting about eight gallons per ton, but the average is about 10 gallons per ton. Um, and it can be applied in the different locations. You can have that uh, liquid uh, coming up onto the spinner, um, could be going into the auger itself, or in this case, there's a little tube running here and it's actually putting the liquid onto the chute. So there's a number of different ways you can do it, but you're still getting that salt wet and it's jump-starting that melting action. So again, the conventional method usually is about 10 gallons per ton. Now, the slurry type um, applications apply a lot more liquid. Now, um, you can buy trucks that are capable of applying that high rate of liquid, or um, MnDOT has a number of trucks that they've uh, modified to um, become slurry applicators. And so the slurry trucks are going to apply um, roughly 30 gallons or more of liquid to a ton of salt. So that's a lot more liquid and that slurry material comes out kind of like wet mud and it just plops onto the roadway and we get much, much better melting action from 
um, slurry applications. In fact, I think that one of the early on um, it, experimental um, times we, we used the slurry tanks and one of the operators told me that he just didn't think it was going to be worthwhile. It wasn't going to work. And, but he gave it a try. And he was um, applying material going through a town and um, the uh, roadway was pretty much um, compacted with snow and ice. And he made a pass through town with the, with the slurry application. And when he turned around to make the um, pass going back the other way, that road had already broken in just a short period of time. So slurry applications do work um, and they really do jumpstart that um, melting process. The other thing about slurry, then we tend to actually um, apply less material overall because you can see that the, the box of the truck is taken up by tanks. So you're not gonna get as much granular material in there, but you don't need as much because of all that liquid jump-starting that melting process. Some agencies have opted to um, use treated salt rather than going to onboard pre-wetting. And I can understand um, why they, they do that. Um, and you don't have to buy this new equipment. You're not buying um, any of these tanks, um, that sort of thing. So you can buy salt that's already treated. And some agencies will have two piles. They'll have a pile of dry salt and a pile of treated salt. Um, but the thing about the treated salt, there's a lot less liquid in it, and it tends to um, still have uh, some issue with bounce and scatter. It doesn't stick as well as um, onboard pre-wetting. In this case, we were adding um, a calcium chloride product to the salt brine or to the granular salt, I'm sorry. And we were also adding dye. The dye helps make it uh, more visible for the, um, for the driver. The thing about the dyes, the question that often comes up is, um, is that safe? And we went through many, many experiments and many, many different companies until we found one that was safe. Um, so this is a relatively high tech type of application for treating the salt using that conveyor and the, the tanks and the pumps on, on this conveyor. You can use a more low tech method to treat your salt also. And so uh, the loader operator um, puts out however many tons of salt, just spreads it out in the yard and then Somebody sprays down that material, that salt, um, and we want to keep it to six gallons per ton. Anything more than that, we tend to find that it leaches out. So six gallons per ton. And you also want to make sure you're using a liquid that's designed to be uh, used for treating the salt pile because it's going to have more organic material in it that helps prevent that leaching. It makes it sticky. Um, so then the, you spray it down and then the loader operator comes back in and mixes it up really well and then stacks it back into the salt shed. So it's a very low tech method of uh, treating your salt, but it can be done. Um, you just wanna make sure you clean up really well afterwards um, because uh, you know, you have a lot of chemical out there. Okay, then I would like to talk a little bit about some of our research programs. And um, we have a number of different research programs um, that are active in Minnesota. So our MnDOT maintenance operations research, um, also known as the MORE research projects, um, we have Clear Roads uh, that has all kinds of different research projects that 
have been done. And Minnesota is the lead state in the Clear Roads Consortium. And then through the Minnesota LTAP, um, we have the Build a Better Mousetrap. And um, we also have the OPERA program, the Local Operational Research Program. Now, all of these are designed to apply real world solutions to maintenance operations. So um, most of them, uh, people will come up and they'll say, well, we have this problem and we've come up with an idea that we think will help solve that problem. And then they receive some kind of funding and um, we try to uh, get that um, research out there then to agencies so that we can have um, more efficient winter maintenance operations. So these will have significant impacts on safety and efficiency and or budgets or our costs. So these are just some photos here that I have of some different things that have been researched. This was through the MnDOT MORE project and it was a salt shoot. And I think this is pretty cool because that blue plastic is a uh, empty bucket from um, uh, the salt, or I'm sorry, the truck wash area. So that the soap came in that blue barrel and they cut it up and used it for a chute. And they found that the chute would wear on the bottom. So they took old mud flaps and we always have broken mud flaps around. So they took old mud flaps and bolted them on and those become the wear edge and they can just be replaced as they wear out. Another thing they did was they cut half circles in the um, different, in the areas of the spinner so that the salt would fall through onto the chute more so than um, going out um, away from the chute. The nice thing about chutes is that when an operator gets to an intersection, maybe top of a ramp, wherever it might be, and you need to broadcast that material, um, you still have the spinner there and you can broadcast. Um, but for the most part, you're applying sort of in a windrow that keeps the material contained. And there is some diagrams on how to build these chutes. And I think they figured with using scrap material like that, it doesn't cost very much. It's like under $100 to put these together. Okay. Um, the opera program, I think most of you have probably heard about this, um, but the opera program um, has provides a lot of funding, up to $20,000 um, for a project. And it has to be new ideas or methods that are going to improve your maintenance operations. And it, um, for opera, it doesn't have to be winter maintenance. It can be any, you know, any time of year. Um, and this was just a winter related um, opera project that Washington County did a few years ago. And they came up with their own style of chute. And in this one, the chute is actually you, um, attached to the um, spinner motor with hose clamps. And the concern was, well, will that damage the spinner motor? And they never had any problems with that. And they just drilled um, holes in every one of the, every other one of the um, areas on that spinner. So the salt would fall through. We found that if we drill holes in each section, the spinner becomes too wobbly and it just kind of flops apart. So every other um, section works best. And the nice thing about this one, it can be turned. Um, so if you want to go uh, apply the salt right behind the wheels or more out towards center line, it can be turned to um, do that. And there are drawings on how to build that particular chute as well. Okay. Um, then we have the Build a Better Mousetrap competition. And this year, Freeborn County um, took second place. 
Um, I don't recall what was first place because I was just looking for winter related um, projects. So, um, but Freeborn County took second place and they had an issue with um, operators climbing up on the uh, um, steps and then stepping out onto uh, the wheels to get up there to clean the ice off of their uh, windshield, which isn't a very safe way to do it. So um, rather than climbing up on the wheels, um, they went back to the factory and they purchased um, factory steps and they modified them and they created these extensions. And that way operators can stand there and safely clean their windshield um, without uh, falling down. And they figured cost is about $200 per truck. And if you think about how much it costs if somebody were to fall from the truck and break a leg or something, um, this is, a, a, I think, very cost effective. So great, um, great idea here. And then uh, in 2020, I think it, um, I think it was first place uh, that Plymouth took uh, for replacing underbody blades. And they were putting the trucks up on lifts and um, it was a three person job. It took quite a while. And so they needed a better method. So they came up with this underbody removal dolly. And um, the system allows the trucks to stay on the ground. They don't have to lit, put it up on the hoist. Um, and it's used to lower the blade. Uh, and there's a bottle, bottle jack used uh, to take the pressure off the rods so they can pound them out. Um, it's safer, it's faster. You figure the blade can be removed in about 45 minutes, which is half the time compared to the other method. So great idea there too. Okay, another um, issue that we've had as more and more trucks are going to LED tail lights um, that they don't get hot like our old incandescent bulbs in there did. So the snow builds up on them. So what can we do? Well, we designed a bunch of different airfoils um, to force the air down over those tail lights to increase visibility. And most of them have very quick and easy installation. This example, this was a MnDOT airfoil. You can see it's um, you know, not real high tech, but it actually works. Now this is an issue that um, pertains um, or it's going to, or oh, let me restate that. This is a technology that is going to be mostly effective for MnDOT and county applications because you're traveling faster than if you're on a city street going at about 20 miles an hour. So um, I don't know if cities would use this, but um, it forces the air down over the lights and keeps them clear. And Stearns County came up with a, a little bit more robust style that they welded together, but it is attached with clamps. So it can be taken off in the summertime, just um, reattached. Uh, in the winter when they're um, in snow and ice operations. <clears throat> so with that, I wanna talk about, some, just kind of reiterate some of the um, steps that we should be taking um, to make our operations more efficient. So institute performance measures. Take a look at that PCA website. Um, they have some good ideas. Um, as institute, um, a level of service and work with your community on um, getting public input on what they want to see as far as their road um, in the wintertime. Work to minimize environmental impacts. Uh, try new technology, try new materials, um, train operators. Um, again, that we've always done it this way mentality is just not going to cut it anymore. Uh, make sure everybody knows about the four R's, um, applying the right material in the right amount, the right location, and at the right time, <clears throat> excuse me, right time. Um, explore new equipment, methods, materials, and technology. 
There's a lot of different new ideas out there. Um, and some of them are very low tech and inexpensive, but can be very helpful. So um, take advantage of all that information that's out there. So at this time, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Does anybody have any questions? Um, that hopefully I can answer. And if I can't, I will um, maybe find the answer and get back to you. As a reminder, you can put your questions in the chat or you can also put them in the Q&A box. Okay, we have a question from Nathan. He's asking, is there a schematic for the airfoil? Um, I don't know right offhand. Um, Nathan, if you can um, send your contact information, I can certainly uh, do some research on that. I, I'm going to assume that there is. Um, I, I can do some research and get back to you on um, finding a schematic for you. Not seeing any more questions, but we can hang on for a couple more minutes just in case. Okay. Okay. And yes, I will I will find that schematic. I know there has to be one out there. Um, and if I have your um, contact information, Nathan, I can send that directly to you or I can um, get it to Claire and maybe they can put it on the um, LTAP website too. Kathy, I'm, I'm linking you two up so that you can share that with him. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, we have one more question from Norman. He's asking, can mousetrap ideas be for parks equipment? I believe that they can be for any kind of equipment. Yeah. Yeah. For parks, you said? Yeah, for parks. Yes, yes. Um, it's not limited to, um, you know, snow and ice or anything like that. It could be for parks equipment. Yep. Yeah. And to answer another question we have um, that I received before, we have recorded today's webinar and it will be posted to the LTAP website. Just give us um, a couple of days, maybe next by next week, we should have it posted. And Kathy, the other question was about the links that you had mentioned for the video. Um, those will be in the recording, but I'm wondering also if maybe if you can share those with me, then I can share that with the attendees. Oh, okay. And that, that video um, on how de-icers work, I think it's six or seven minutes. All of, all of those Iowa training videos 
are from five to 12 minutes long. They're very short, but they're very informative. So um, Claire, I'll actually share that link with you. Great, and I think if, it, if you're mentioning that it's the Iowa one, I believe that's on our resource page as well for snow and ice control. Okay, okay. And they had some older ones. They just redid these a couple of years ago. So um, we wanna make sure that they're the newer version. Yeah, I believe it's the 2020. Okay, perfect. And then Steve is just asking the chat, how is the road salt symposium different from this webinar? Um, okay, the Road Salt Symposium, um, they, they organized that um, with, uh, let's see, the first half of the day, they have um, speakers talking about uh, different methods and materials that are used in winter maintenance. And then the second part of the day is um, speakers who are addressing um, salt issues within the water. So, um, it, so it's environmentalists speaking on the second part of the day, or it could be vice versa. I can't remember um, exactly who goes first and who goes second, but it's a combination of environmentalists and um, winter maintenance um, speakers. So this kind of covers some of the things that they, that they talk about. So we're not getting any other questions, but Kathy, a lot of people thanking you in the chat and looks like we even had some people attending from different states. So that's oh, kind of cool. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you everybody for attending. And again, if you have any further questions, you can pass them through Claire and hopefully I can get back to you and, and get an answer for you. Oh, and I will say my, my, um, Contact information is on the first slide, so you can always email me um, directly. Yep, I also popped that in the chat. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, great. If you wanna wrap up now, Kathy. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Yep, bye.